Welcome to Beyond the Big Sky, Episode 2. I'm Chad Shear. And I'm Wyatt Shear. And we're going to be talking about Western big game hunting, planning, preparing, and everything you need to know to get ready for your hunt this fall. So let's talk about some tips. We know a lot of the results came out for hunting out west, Colorado, Wyoming, Montana. What some things, let's just start out, what would be in your backpack when you go to those states to hunt? Okay, first off, talking about backpacks, you want to have a good, comfortable backpack. That's that's so important. Uh, this last uh, couple of weeks ago, we went over to Hawaii and we're hunting over there. I had a NUMA day pack, which is great. So you need to decide if you're going to go in and you're out of a base camp and you're going in for a uh, just on daily hunts, or if you're going to go way back in, you're going to need a bigger backpack, like something that may have 4,500 uh, cubic inches in it where you can put your tent, your sleeping bag. And so that is a big thing. But first off, one of the most important things I always take with me is a good GPS with extra batteries. And I like having it set up uh, with like how Onyx is, I use that a lot where it has all the boundaries on it. Especially like in Colorado, hunting on the public land. I mean, yep. that is a big deal when you're hunting next to private. It, it is a very big deal. Those animals move in and out of there. Um, and I love it where you can have a messaging system. And so if something happens to you, because if you're hunting alone, it's very important to be able to communicate and having that satellite uh, with you on your GPS to communicate, that, that's going to be one of the first things I put in there. So let's talk about if you are hunting out of a lodge, <clears throat> you're going to have a smaller backpack. Like you said, those Numas. I had the same one in Hawaii, and it didn't have, it's not a pack frame like style, but it had that wire in it, mm-hmm. and that is really nice. We put a lot of weight in it, didn't, it didn't crunch on your back. It was, it's comfortable. You want something with breathability. So often on a backpack, you're carrying a lot of weight, you're, you're hunting, and it can be warmer, especially early, early season. So you want something that is on the back that, that's breathable, lets that air circulate through there. Good, comfortable uh, straps. One of the things, why I've watched you do over the years is you always have a good hydration system. You know, you always have to have a camelback or something because there's nothing worse than when you're hunting in the mountains. and you, It's a pain to pack all the bottles of water and a filtration system. What kind of filtration system? I mean, it's easier to filtrate water if you know there's a creek up there than hauling it all. And, and that's so true. And that's part of your big game scouting going in early. Uh, we've got a good friend of ours that does a lot of stuff where he'll go into an area and he went in there and didn't find any water. So he had to spend his summertime packing water in there. The animals were coming through as transition areas. So make sure you have a good way to hydrate. That's very important. And the other thing is if you're hunting out west, you got to watch for Giardia. I have personally had that when I was younger. And I will tell you, it hospitalized me. It was no fun so make sure that you you uh take precautions with that so Uh, what filters are you using are you using the lights the filters the pills what are you doing you know i've tried a little bit of everything um one of my things i like to do is take one of the uh, little uh Tsons, it's a jet boil type system where I can boil the water. I know that's the safest. Kills um, everything. Yeah, it, it does. Um, and I, I'm 100% sure. I'm a little little uh, nervous about that, Charity. It was, I was sick for over a month. So uh, uh, that's something that's very important. Make sure you've got your water and hydration system figured out. And let's talk about food. Like if you're going back in the way back in the on horses or something you want something heavy what are you taking back when you're doing that you know if we're going way back in there i'm going to plan it depends if i'm i'm going in for two or three days or if i'm going in for a week um we've got a new sponsor on our tv show that's been pretty cool or the real eats which they're vacuum sealed they're fresh and then you can freeze them if you're taking a, a cooler in, that's always great. We throw a mammoth cooler and fill that up and going back in. If you're going in with panniers or, or how you're packing, that works out great. Or if you're in a base camp going out, of course, your freeze-dried uh, or your dehydrated food. That's just add really water. Good. You just add water. And uh, so those are some good options. It just depends on what you're doing. But for a lot of those things that I tell people is you don't always want to commit. If, if it's an area you haven't hunted before, don't take stuff for six or seven days because what if you get in there and the animals aren't there? I like to go in and go in for one or two and have enough stuff where, okay, and come back out and go back in and uh, stay a little longer if I want. So we talked about backpack. <clears throat> I mean, next thing that comes to mind is good shoes. 
There's nothing worse than going on a hunt and having new shoes or shoes that hurt your feet. You know, having outfitted elk hunters for 30 years, that's the one thing I always would say is make sure you have good boots. We use Kenetrex. I know you've used those most of your life. And they're they're out of Montana here. They're lightweight. They're comfortable. They, they've got several different brands, or I'm sorry, several different models. That Corey 2 is a lightweight for bow season. And then you go up from there. Some of you folks work in an office. You're not out in the mountains. For us, everyday life, we can wear our Kenetrex. I, I tell people, even if you sit at a desk all day, put those on, wear them around, keep them on your feet, and, and then take them out on the weekends or evenings, walk with them. And even make, oil them, too. Make, yeah, make sure they bro, they're broke in. They, they've got some really good uh, products, Kenetrex does, to, to treat them and uh that that's very important and uh, i think something else too why that we always talk about with our backpacks not jumping back and forth with that is but to to dress in the layer system mm -hmm. and make sure in your pack you have enough layers raincoats yep i mean i, I know when we all go i mean we have all have raincoats then we've got an extra pair of pants if they get wet or something there's nothing worse than getting like soaking oh. wet and then having to sit out there and speaking of that having a good fire starter so important out there because you got to dry off if you get caught in one of these storms in the rocky mountains it is it is crazy you need to get get dry because if you're you're going to get hypothermia out there and that is a horrible horrible thing and something i know a lot of people don't think of is like a gun little gun cleaning kit if you take a muzzleloader yeah yep I mean, you can't just, if you have to push a load out or if it gets wet or something, or what's your trick whenever it's raining out? <laughs> My trick is I always take surgical gloves when I'm uh, cleaning, field dressing my animals. And so I will take and cut one of the fingers off. Make sure the glove isn't on your hand when you do that. <laughs> but I'll take that uh, surgical glove and uh, one of the fingers, I'll put it right over the barrel and that that keeps my powder dry in which case is water gets sent. In, in case water it's it's very very important uh, with that and then i was thinking about some of the other stuff in the in the pack that that we always do is we we like we said we have the fire starter but then we have a good knife because having a good knife for field dressing your animals but also for lighting fires because you can get that wood you can peel it back that's a trick i learned up in the yukon years years ago hunting with terry wilkinson that guy knew how to light fires and what he would do is he'd take about a two inch stick and he'd just whittle it down shave it, off. shave it down and make little almost like duck butts like several of them and then you get a fire going quick i know i that. see a lot of people they even take like a little file or a rasp and they'll take it and shave it and you almost get like little wood chips you know that's a great idea. Why that that's super. Here's another little secret: is um, dryer lint. <laughs> if wash and clothes, take that dryer lint. That stuff will light real quick, and you can put put that in a little Ziploc bag in your pack, and that that's good. And, or fire starter. If you don't have a fire starter too, a lot of people take their matches and have a little candle and dip them in wax, and so then you waterproof them. Yep. So I mean, your matches get wet, they still light. Yeah. It's kind of a little trick. That's a great trick. My my dad used to do that when I was growing up, and that that's something very important. There's so many things you can do with your backpack, but the biggest thing is don't overpack it, but make sure you have enough survival gear, have, have some Band-Aids, some first aid stuff, and in, in case something happens because stuff can happen out there and, and then I'm, be ready to pack those elk out. And I know you do this a lot too is have ibuprofen, Advil. I mean, you never know. Like when you were on your elk hunt and broke your leg, you want to have something just to knock the pain out to get to the doctor if something does happen. That is true. So you brought that up. That was Arizona. I drew a premier elk tag, one of those tags that'll take about 14 years to draw. Had a big bull scouted, was down there, got on this mule, and I've ridden a lot of mules. I guided off them for years. I love uh, mules. This is why we don't ride mules anymore. I should say I used to love mules. No, we don't love mules anymore. <laughs> we ride horses. <laughs> what kind of quarter horses do we ride? Yeah, we ride Linnell Ashley's quarter horses, <laughs> and they don't try to kill us and break our legs. <laughs> so anyway, we're at Trailhead. It's about 3.30 in the morning. I am so excited, and we're getting ready to take off. I throw my leg over this mule, and this mule blows up. I mean, he's bucking. I get my 
reins into my knee and I'm getting him in circles. I just about got him and he blows up again. And my guide starts yelling, jump, jump. And I always learned you don't jump off a mule or a horse if you have it under control. Well, I don't know why he said it. I went to dismount when I did, he bucked into me and he threw me up in the air I came down, and when my boot hit the ground, I heard a snap. I snapped my fibia completely in half. I bet that didn't feel good. No. I dislocated my ankle, and I'm laying there, and the guy's like, you okay? I'm like, I am not. I've never really broken a bone severely, but I knew I had. I said, why were you telling me to jump? He said, well, there was a forest service trailhead map and they had a metal roof on it and he said you were going right towards it you couldn't see it but i could he said i thought it was going to cut your head off if that mule took you under there so i guess a broken bone is better than uh, getting your head cut off and uh moral of the story is don't ride a mule don't ride a mule well that brings up another good point why you talked about packing in there If some of you folks are going on a hunt and you're going with an outfitter that uses horses, and I'll tell you, I love horses. I love going back in the back country. You're getting way away from the roads and and you can get into some majestic country. I know why sometimes you'll jump in and you'll go 15 miles or, or more. But if you're going on a back country hunt like that, make sure that say you live in Pennsylvania, say you live in New York or or California, wherever you might live and and you're planning on that, find a stable that has riding lessons. You don't necessarily need the riding lessons, but you need to get in shape. Is that not true? How many hours do you spend on a horse? A lot. I just got done riding one. And I think a lot of people, when they go on an outfitter, they're trying to adjust their stirrups if they're horseback. One of the most painful thing is not having your stirrup set. Well, and tell a, me about that. How do you adjust And the trick is, okay, on the rule of thumb for just getting set close, right? If you put your finger up where the stirrup connects to the saddle, it should come to your armpit. If it comes there, that's the same length your stirrup should be. So that is a pretty close. It'll get with you within an inch. Then once you get on, if you ride for a little bit and your knees start hurting, you realize, okay, my stirrups are a little too short, drop them down. If your hips start hurting or the inside of your thighs, then they're too long and you can't feel them. So you should be able just to stand up and get off that saddle enough. How much room should they have if they stand up in that You stirrup? should be able to fit like four fingers under. Four fingers. And yeah. the other thing you brought this up, that, and I was thankful I did this on that, that mule, is make sure you have a bigger stirrup. Exactly. Um, because you're in hunting boots. You're not in cowboy boots typically. And if your foot gets hung up in that stirrup, that's a whole nother problem. And I've seen some people I'll take too. They don't, they put their foot in too far. I mean, all you need is the ball of your foot on that stirrup. And if you've got it jammed all the way in there to your, almost to your heel, then if something goes wrong, you're stuck. Yeah. It's and lot, that's no it's a lot better to come off and break your leg than get drug and banged off trees. Yep. And now for somebody going on a, on a first time elk hunt in the back country and they're on horses, Outfitter's going to do his best. Guide's going to do their best, but they're not the one on that horse. What else yeah. should, what is some body language or as far as the cinch, what should be that they be looking for or feeling? I mean, a lot of people don't realize if you are nervous, the horse is feeling it. Yeah. They're some of the smartest creatures. And if you're tense, they're going to be tense. Like I know, like when I go to rodeo, I could take my horse, move cows, and he's the most relaxed. As soon as he hears music and I get tensed up, he's a different horse. Yeah. So, I mean, your body language can put off a lot of pressure to them so like even if you're nervous if you just relax breathe take it easy they're just going to do their job and take care of you absolutely any other the pointers when they're sitting there what if they start to lean one way or that saddle starts to creep you know i've seen that a lot taking some friends up in the mountains especially something to do is make sure like when you put your backpack on some people don't tighten the straps down on each side the same so then they'll get to lean in and they're used to it but if you're leaning on top of a horse, over time you keep leaning. If you just constantly make sure your saddle horn is straight, yeah. oh, it makes so much life so much easier. What about overhanging branches? Yeah, that's. <laughs> I mean, a trick if you want to knock someone off, just hold it, keep walking. When they get behind you, let it go and have a little fun. But, I mean, the best thing is to try to avoid them. I mean, a lot of places they have all the trails clean. But I know you have some stories with pine cones, too. Oh, well, yeah. We, we're not, we'll save that for another podcast. Mm-hmm. 
<laughs> well, maybe we just should have. Back in our day when I was guiding down at Lakeview Guest Ranch, the guides would go out and they'd be scouting. And you get a bunch of guides out there having fun in that. One of the tricks they do is ride up behind the other uh, guide, grab the horse's tail, and put a pine cone they, there. And the horse would automatically suck down on that and it'd poke them. And uh, you'd have a little bucking going on. And I know a lot of times... Fly- <laughs> Guides aren't going to do that to clients' horses. <laughs> That's so. just to mess with their buddies. <laughs> and another thing that I think is a big deal is flashlights. Yes, absolutely. So many people think, well, that's too expensive by a flashlight. A little story, Walker and I took some clients in, backcountry on horses. We dropped them off, and we were in a hurry, and Walker had his flashlight. But we're like, you know, we don't, we'll just wait. Just to, We never want to use the whole battery when we're not out just in case something did happen. Yep. And we were like an hour and a half from the truck, and all we had was our iPhone batteries, our iPhone flashlights. And I, I really did not enjoy just sitting there <laughs> hoping my horse knew his way back to the trailer. It was yep. very, very freaky. Yep. I, and I will tell you, that's the one thing, hunting horseback, I love. Um, that's a great point. There's been times I've been on horses coming out of the mountains in the dark, and I couldn't see anything. And the, the lights were would spook the horse or mule, and i just have to put the reins lightly and just – let them go because they're scared of shadows i mean you put a flashlight in the tree branch moves and the shadow shakes i mean they're not used to that they're not so so get ready for that hunt go to a a local uh, equestrian center or somebody and tell them what you want to do and just at least get comfortable with it because some of these guys down in wyoming and these wilderness hunts they'll go in 15 20 25 miles and if you've not done that you're going to be sore and especially getting off and on I mean, we've seen that when we go horseback. Some of the people, it's, you just get them on and you just want to go because you know how miserable it is trying to get the people off and on. I mean, that's something, even if you just go for a couple of days, just to learn how to properly get off and on your horse. So if you need to stop and go to the bathroom, it doesn't take 30 minutes to try to hoist, <laughs> get all the guides to throw you on. Yep. And the other thing, remember this, it's okay if you have room there, turn your horse so you're on the uphill side of course you're going to get on the left side but don't ever try to get on that horse on the downhill side up in the mountains that that makes a makes a huge difference so as you prepare we're, we're talking about western big game hunts and getting ready what you put in your pack and, and preparing i think one other thing that's important right now with the the price of gas and the price of travel is start thinking about traveling you know i've flown over a million miles on delta and and i get a few benefits on that where i get a 70 pound bag instead of 50 pounds and reminds me of a trip we had in new mexico and brought your whole elk back in the rack and tried to fit that in a rental car that's that's something interesting but when you plan these trips plan your travel accordingly and if you're coming from the east coast or west coast you may want to consider driving because yeah. you're you're fortunate enough. You got to get that meat back. You got to meat get that antlers. rack back. And a little trick you could tell them too is like when if you can fly with your rack, how do you protect the tips from not breaking? Absolutely, is take a rubber hose, Just cut it in pieces, hose. a garden hose, put it over the ends of those racks, and then tape them up with duct tape, and that protects them. The other thing that will help you too, and cost on shipping now. If you shoot a nice bull and you're wanting to put in Pope and Young or Boone and Crockett, you can't split that skull. But if you're just want, you say, oh, I'm not going to put it in the books, I just want to have it mounted, you can cut that skull in a Z shape or, or a Y type shape or, or so forth, actually a V on the side, so that the taxidermist can put it back together really good. And then you put them flat together and it's a lot easier to travel with them, especially on a mule deer or whitetail. Um, if you're traveling over um, in places like that. The other thing is look at look at rental cars, uh, look at different things, talk to your outfitter. Are they going to pick you up? Or if you're doing it on your own, uh, think of those things. A lot of folks I've watched over the years, they'll take a chest freezer and put it in the back of their truck mm-hmm. that can be locked. And so when they stop for the night at a hotel, they plug it in or they'll take a generator and turn it on. And that, that keeps that meat frozen all the way back. So you're planning on preparing for these trips, and we talked about you get to travel. Make sure you have your licenses, everything in order prior to that. But it's time to get ready for it. Now, being in physical shape is one thing that that you wanna you wanna do. Now I know I'm a little bigger guy. 
but I still have to get ready. I'll ride a bike. I'll, I'll do different things to get ready. I tell people if you live in an urban area, find a uh, gymnasium or find a football stadium that has bleachers and start walking steps. That's about all you'll do in the mountains, though, kind of. It's or if you go to a gym, do the step step <laughs> machine up and down, and that, and that is painful. It is. I know at Planet Fitness when Keely and I go, that is the most miserable thing is to go straight up the steps. It it is, but that's that's what's going to get those muscles ready for you, get some get some cardiovascular built up. Now, one of the things I was talking to Marcia before this podcast and we were talking about stuff we'd shared in seminars we do seminars at the uh, great american outdoor sports show in harrisburg every year with nra and we love doing it and one of the uh seminars we do is uh planning guided and unguided western hunts getting the best out of that and one thing that i do recommend if you're coming from a low elevation say you're coming from sea level or even three to five hundred feet and you're heading out to montana or even Colorado, where you may be at 10, 11,000 feet, you got to watch for elevation sickness. That'll hurt somebody, too. Whew, it will. So I tell people, allow some extra time. Get in there a couple days early. Let your body acclimate to it. And uh, over the years, I, I've guided people that have gotten elevation sickness, and it just ruined the hunt for them. Um, one thing, uh, talking to several doctors you want to be aware of is – Stay away from alcohol and smoking, which that's not good when you're hunting anyway, but that will increase the effects of altitude sickness out there. And uh, you talk about being sick and major headaches and just not wanting to do anything. It's no fun. And I think, too, like people going back country, so many people don't stay hydrated. Yep. I mean, you've taken people that have had heat strokes and stuff. That's It's a pain to carry more water, but... I mean, always pack more than you need. I will tell you, I had one guy specifically, a good friend of mine, that he started just, he wasn't himself, and I rushed him to the hospital. I thought he was having a stroke or a heart attack. It scared me, and I will tell you, hydration is super important. And watch drinking too much caffeine out there, exactly. too. Exactly. And what flashlight would you recommend? I mean, what's LEDs, I know, save battery. Yep. I want something that has a couple different stages on it. I want, I, I've used a lot of the stream lights. I want something that I can have different batteries. I use that, uh, a lot of them that have the 123 um, A style battery. Um, but also it's nice to have something with a, a AAA or a AA so you can find them if you're in a remote area out west. Um, but the Streamlight ones have been real good. I like the variable power, so I can go with a light power or if I don't need it. Or if I'm tracking something and I need more power, I, I do that. So um, have, that's that's a very good question. And let's talk about what would you prepare for as far as, like, shot uh, yardage. I mean, when that, people are from out east and their farthest shot might be 65 yards, you come out – I mean, you come to Montana, you can shoot as far as you can see. That, that's exactly right. And, you know, we have the Bergara Academy up here at our place in Montana, and I'm fortunate to manage that. We teach people how to shoot out to 1,400 yards, but we don't teach them to shoot animals that far. Out of respect to big game, I don't like over 500 yards. Now, can I do it? Can I shoot steel all day long? Yes. But I will tell you, learning to read wind is something that is a skill that takes a lot of time. And learning to shoot long distances, one of our instructors, uh, Bart Bartholomew, he always says, shooting is a perishable skill. And that's mm -hmm. so true. And you have to practice it. And so I tell people, get the best gun you can, get the best optics you can, and then practice. And you want to be able to shoot. You want to make a three to 400-yard shot, especially out west. 500 is great. But some people will overcomplicate it. They'll get the get the scopes and they have all the bells and whistles on it, but they don't know how to use them. So you want to learn that gun. We always say know the dope on your gun, and that's data on previous engagements. And so keep a record of that. Now, choosing the caliber, Wyatt, I know we've talked about this a lot. What's your favorite caliber for elk? I mean, for elk, it's hard to beat a 300 Win Mag. 300 Win Mag, 300 PRC. I, everyone seems to ask, can you do it with a 6.5 Creedmoor? 
you can. I mean, Walker's killed big elk with him. We've all shot elk with him, but my whole theory is if you can have a 300, why wouldn't you take it? That's exactly right. And this is what I tell people is, can you deal with it? You just deal with a 243. We did, we've done that before when you guys were younger. It's all about bullet placement. It's about having a good bullet. Mm -hmm. So one thing I love about Arms Corps is they use premium components. And like we use the Nosler Acubon bullets in there have had tremendous success with that 180 grain bullet. But a 300 Win Mag versus a 6.5, it's more forgiving. If you miss your ju misjudge your wind by five to 10 miles an hour and you get a little more drift or that bull takes a step, with the 300, you're probably going to recover it. With a 6.5, you've got a lighter bullet. You don't have the knockdown power. Um, it's not something you want to take that chance on. So, I mean, I saw you shot that one bull. It was 400 yards, and you put. I mean, it went through both shoulder blades and just powered through it. Yep. That's something a 6.5 will not handle. No, it's 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 very important to have it. And we could say what's the best elk caliber, and if we opened it up. I would have a hundred different. I've done that in my seminars before. I'll have several hundred people in there. I say, okay, how many shoot a 30 odd six? How many shoot a seven mag for elk? How many shoot 300? And you know what? It is so divided. And so what I tell people, get a gun that you know that shoots well with the most most expensive optic or the, the best optic you can afford on there. And you don't have to break the bank on that. We use good quality optics. We, I've taken lots of elk with Conus Optics, which is our price point optic. You want something that, that is going to get the job done, but also gives you clarity at last light. And I think that's that's very important. So on those calibers, Wyatt, you're definitely 100% right. And uh, I just I love going after them with anything. I mean, they're coming out doing mule deer, whitetail, antelope. 6.5 is an incredible cartridge. Incredible. Yep. Yep. It's it's great, and uh, we've taken that. We we uh, hunted with the six five PRC, and uh, we started shooting that some, and I really am impressed with that. And uh, growing up, a two seventy, that was my caliber of choice. And well, twenty five odd six, a lot of people don't shoot that. <laughs> twenty five odd six is great, and just so many great calibers. But the thing that I really love is how hard the bullet companies have worked to come out with really good bullets the powder companies like Hodgson and IMR to give you consistent powders where your deviation are in the single digits and that that makes such a such an important part of getting ready for your western big game hunt let's talk about muzzleloaders i mean what muzzleloader are you taking i mean how far are you shooting it what loads are you doing that's something a lot of people don't know. They're not used to, they're used to shooting their 50 cal out to 100 yards at the most. That's exactly right. And I would just tell you, we could do a whole podcast on muzzleloaders, and we'll probably do that because I love hunting with a muzzleloader. Um, I've went to Africa and hunted Cape Buffalo with them, um, all the way down to, to hunting small game with them. I just, I love it, the challenge of the one shot. So if I'm going out west, there's a couple big factors here. First off, I see what's legal in the states I'm going to hunt. Exactly. I'm going to find out if it's open sites, like Colorado, you have to have loose powder, open sites. Um, some places it, it requires certain types of bullets. Uh, the power belt bullets are, are legal in Colorado. Um, and, but some places do not allow sabotage bullets at all. So you got to figure that out and then figure out what caliber is legal, 40 caliber, a 45, a 50. And am I going to use it in a muzzleloader only season or am I going to use it in a rifle? Like season? Montana where we hunt, they don't have a muzzleloader season. Well, they, they haven't had one for the inlines. And then this year they've opened it up for a traditional. more traditional primitive one. And when Wyatt's talking about that, because we love using the inlines the traditional one that's a whole different set of, set of things so that's right not now, for me not for you so i'll right, stick with the paramount there you go so let's talk about say uh, like this year i have a new mexico hunt and uh, i'm going to use a cva paramount pro i'm going to use blackhorn 209 primer um and i'm going to do my i'm going to build my data up on that and i will tell you i'm very comfortable at 300 yards i've taken antelope at 312 yards with with that gun and, and the it's... knockdown power with that oh i mean it's... the big bullet and it puts a i mean it punches a hole through them it does i mean we 
we had one guy with us, Keith Wood, outdoor writer, buddy of mine, was with me in Wyoming. He shot an antelope at 400 plus yards, or like 412, I think. And I watched that bullet go completely through him. So very, very good. That has a Vera flame, so it's very consistent. Um, and and that's a great ignition system I love. So that CVA Paramount Pro or the Paramount HTR, um, I love that because that HDR has an adjustable cheek piece, so you get a good weld right there when you're when you're aiming. So uh, the biggest thing though is shoot those guns at those distances prior to it. Make sure you know what's, and what's going on. And I think not just shooting on a bench. I mean, that's something when we were kids, you really enforce. Okay, let's try shooting, laying down, kneeling, sitting, standing off shooting sticks. There's so many ways. Absolutely. What is the one thing I'm putting you on the spot here that I always made sure that we set you up on when you were getting ready to shoot? You always made sure we had our elbow put somewhere. Yep. And we always had a three point position where you could always push down on something. Exactly. Had a rest. Even if it was me holding their elbow and securing it so that they weren't moving all over. And that that's very important. And it's, it's something if I can get in a prone position, I'm all about that. We'll talk about different positions on other podcasts as ankles down and, and different things. But it's very important that, that you don't have scope shadow. And, yep. and it's very, very important when you're hunting with a muzzleloader and hunting with a rifle, you have a, a good solid rest. Exactly. And even shooting a bow, so many people only shoot their bows standing up. <laughs> I mean, I know when I practice, I get in the habit, you just get excited and just go do some reps standing up. But so many times you can't just stand up next to a tree you have to kneel down behind a bush or sit on your butt and it is way harder to do that than just standing there you are so correct on that in fact this year actually this bull right behind us we were hunting it was open country we're crouched down in this little dip and behind the pack and I'll tell you, the first thing that I was very thankful for, I always maxed my bow out. I always would shoot 70 to 75 pounds, and that's just, I like the speed on it. This year, I had a bow, uh, Expedition Archery. I had one of their bows. It was amazing, but I shot it at 65 pounds, and it was performing amazing. But I drew the bow back. Kind of sideways. Sideways, and then had to sit up to get the shot i couldn't be in perfect form and that's something that's so true is practice and and that brings up another point i thought of is when you guys were younger especially we'd lay the bow down we would run 30 40 yards come back pick the bow up and then try to get your breathing in order try to get it under control because that's a big thing you have adrenaline coming when those animals are coming in and plus, if you're at higher elevation, you're breathing a little heavier. So practice those ways and build that muscle memory up. I mean, I know when we were kids, Walker and I, we'd run all the way around the house a full lap, and then we'd shoot our bows just to see who could be the best. I mean, it was a little competition, but it really taught you to calm down, pace yourself, and just breathe. It, it's totally true. And the other thing that's that's fun to do out there, a game we play, is you have that where – you have the person sit there and you start at the target and you walk left, right, different directions. And then one guy says, shoot. And you have to turn around and shoot without knowing what your yardage is. Mm -hmm. And what happens is range finders are great, but sometimes those bulls come in or those deer are in your lap quick and you got to learn to make a quick judgment on it where you may not have time to pull that range finder up and that'll that'll help you a lot and i know something too that i try is okay i know my bow shoots at 30 and if okay if i'm at 42 yards what's if i put my 40 yard pin it how much does it drop from 40 to 50 right because i'm not going to shoot an elk that if it's if i know for sure it's under 40 yards if you put your 30 yard pin on you're going to kill it right but if it's over that then you're probably going to need to spend the time and range it just to have an exact. Exactly right. And I can tell you, if I've got a bowl at 30 yards or under. No question. I know exactly. I can take my 20-yard pin, and I know, okay, I just need to put two inches up. So I, I practice those those scenarios when, when I'm out there because real practice makes a big difference. You know, I know something people don't really do that they 
it's messed them up a lot is checking their rifle, make sure it's zeroed once they get here. I mean, elevation takes a toll on different velocities and how your gun performs. It, it totally does. And, and I learned that years ago coming from 4,500 feet and then flying down and doing a hunt at 10,000 feet. And all of a sudden I was hitting my target higher and it didn't have anything to do with getting bumped. It's just your velocities and, and it has to do with elevation and, and, very very important with bullet drag and uh so keep that in mind no matter if you drive or fly check that gun be adamant about it when you get into a new area i mean a lot of times too like when you go to hawaii even sometimes 90 percent of the times it's dead on or what, the lower elevation it's a little low or something yep. but yep that's so true i i could tell you stories of going on hunts where people get in late oh i'm i'm just gonna go for it and then they had that one opportunity on an animal and they miss it by three feet and they're like oh i should have shot that gun i would rather miss the first morning of hunting everything ready and make sure my gun's ready to go and then like when you're coming with a muzzleloader what is going to be in your cleaning pouch when you go back country Back country cleaning pouch, I'm going to keep it really, real easy. I'm going to make sure I have a cleaning jag that will fit on my ramrod so I don't have to take another, like a range rod with me. I'm going to have some patches with me. I'm going to have a little bit of cleaning solvent with me. The other thing I always do is I have a little bit of breech plug grease for putting that in there and I'll have a tool to get that breech plug out or if I'm using like a, a CVA MRX or LRX in the Acura series or even the Optimore Wolf, well, I can take it out with hands free. Uh, the other thing is it's good to have a little pick with you to make sure there's no obstruction in that uh, firing hole they called or the, the breech plug uh, hole. It's very, very important to to have that and you can take a little ballastol. They've got some wipes that you can wipe it down, especially if you're in uh, areas where you're getting a lot of moisture. The CVAs have Cerakoted barrels. Um, they're nitrate on the inside, but it's still good. Wipe, wipe everything down and, and keep those guns clean. And then one other thing I'll put in there is I'll take some lens cleaner. It's, it, you want to do it. Quake has some great scope covers uh, that I use, but you also want to have something. If you get a snow can hit like this or rain, you want to keep that optic clean and i think too is some of the places like out here in montana when it's 20 below out and you keep your gun in the truck and then it's you're driving around then you go on a stock some people don't look i mean that fog will kill somebody you know it's 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 horrible that condensation uh i was doing hunts in uh, iowa where we would go hunt the morning come back and then go back out and hunt the evenings and it was cold temperatures and you'd have a big temperature swing and what you would find is no different than your glasses fogging up that was happening in the barrel you say what did you do i emptied my gun every time i had that i keep it in my case and i try to keep it cool but if you put it in the cab of a truck in a case it all of a sudden it warms up you get that condensation and for me the worst sound you can hear is when you have that big old deer out there elk is click and That's you don't have one a going chance. It's, i mean it's not like a rifle where you can just take the shell out and put another one in a lot of times you're not gonna be able to take the time push the load out and start all over no nope. it's it's not now i will tell you um w different things have happened i've had people call me up and they're in the stand hey chad my gun won't go off <laughs> i got this big deer right there I'm like, what's happening? I cocked the hammer, but it won't stay. Well, what happens is they didn't clean it properly, and so they've had some fouling build up, and so that gun isn't shut all the way, or they don't take the breech plug and have it tightened all the way. It's a safety mechanism on them. So I'll tell them, tighten your breech plug, and I'll try it. And you hear it click, draw back, they got the hammer cocked, and then boom, and then all of a sudden, I got him, and that's always great. The other thing I'll tell them sometimes is, slam it shut if you if it's not if you've got that gun and it won't cock on you slam it shut and make sure that that you're good to go that way you know i think that's a lot of coverage for people especially everybody's getting ready for the summer get in shape be ready i mean there's nothing worse than not being in shape and there's a like a big elk or a big mule deer and you can't physically get to it that that is so true and over the years i've guided hunters and they're sitting there breathing heavy and you're just like man we just need 20 more yards and they look at you and say i don't have it 
if you're if you're going to take the time and do it and and spend the investment do your part and and you don't have to be in the best shape but this is one thing i'll tell you too if you're going on a guided hunt communicate tell the outfitter if you're doing the guided hunt say listen i'm not in the greatest shape i'm going to do the best i can but let him or her know so that they can prepare and put you in an area um and, and the and difference in guides it, i mean like <laughs> If you have someone coming, you know, you can't walk, you might save an area for him instead of not knowing. And then you have to hike to the top of the mountain and practically kill the guy. Yeah, it's 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 so true. And if you have any physical ailments, if if you have anything, don't be afraid. I, I'll just tell you, I had one guy and I know we're trying to wrap this up, but I had one guy show up in camp and he had Parkinson's disease. And I always would have a form that that was filled out and that i'd have him fill out with a health history and he didn't put it on there and he could barely walk to our tent and we were talking about it and such a wonderful guy nice guy i'm like this is information i needed to know he said why well, I, I was afraid you wouldn't book me if, if you knew the shape i was in i said no i just would have planned a little planned different. a little bit different and we ended up helping him and getting him out there and uh, making it where he could have some success. And, and if an outfitter knows that there are areas, um, you can get handicap stickers for vehicles uh, where they can hunt out of a vehicle a little more off of county roads. And, and there's ways to help people with some of those physical limitations uh, succeed out there. So always be right up front with them and uh, just, just have fun. That's what it's all about. I think that was a lot of information, and uh, hopefully we might come back on some of these topics a little bit later, but that is episode two. Episode two of Beyond the Big Sky. Wyatt, thank you so much. I've enjoyed being on here tonight, and I uh, can't wait for uh, the next episode.